is the second time. This is the second time that we've uh, done this with the uh, uh, constraints of Zoom. And I'm sorry I can't hold things up and show you very much. Uh, I'll try and give that in the PowerPoint. There is also some information that can be made available to people if they're interested. Uh, I'm, we're going to post it on the PeninsularRoseSociety.org site. And that is a uh, write up from the January newsletter that we did. And it's a summary of pruning. So there's a Word document, there's some slides that'll be available, there's a recording of this. So get out there and prune. Now's the time, and I'll talk about that. Let me start the uh, slides here. And uh, I'm going to go to full screen. And the, uh, can you see that? I hope. I'll, I'll uh, trust that you can at this point, since everybody's going to be muted. Uh, I'm going to uh, go through these and uh, provide the uh, information. Like I said, it will be recorded. And so if you have any questions, uh, put them on the chat. Uh, if you know how to do that, that's down at the bottom, the little chat box, and you can uh, make that question and we'll try and answer them at the end, unless there's some specific uh, problem that you have getting onto the uh, site or getting the information. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, make sure, whoop, sorry. One of the things I want to make sure is that you have uh, some information about what to do and when to do it. We're going to have a window between now and about the middle of February when the roses are about as dormant as they get. Now's the time to prune roses in our area. And uh, modern roses don't all go uh, to the point of dormancy, full dormancy. Only some very old roses go completely dormant. The uh, best time to prune though is now. You want to prune out dead, diseased, or damaged, and any crossed, crossing or weak canes, especially in the middle, and any suckers. Now is a great time to do all that. But if they are once blooming, meaning they, they have a single bloom in the spring, you don't want to prune, prune those now. You bloom them, they bloom after the, uh, uh, well, they bloom, and then you want to prune after that. You want to shape plants, prune large plants, leaving pencil-sized canes typically. And if the plant's getting too big, prune it aggressively. If it's too small, prune it lightly. It's also a good time to move or replant or repot roses in the Bay Area, right on through the middle of February. Tools. Uh, it's always good to get good, sharp tools and to protect yourself. You want to uh, protect your head, hands, arms, and eyes. If you have goggles or glasses that you wear, typically it's a good time to wear them. But you want to sharpen the tools. A good pair of shears, I always uh, want to have uh, shears that can cut paper. I fold over a piece of paper and I demonstrate it by cutting that paper. And it tells me it's, it's sharp. So it's also something that can cut you, so be careful of that. If you do get a scratch or a thorn puncture, you want to use something that is a, a liquid type antiseptic, I, like I did myself. You want to use bypass pruners, meaning one blade bypasses the other. There are several illustrated in this, some from Felco, uh, and some are lopping shears one by Wiss there, but there are many brands. What you want is a sharp bypass pruner. You can sharpen them with a, a hone, uh, that's a diamond hone in the illustration, or you can use a, uh, uh, the kind that you can buy as a silicon carbide uh, sharpener and scrape it along the blade at the angle of the bevel. This makes it easy on you and on the rose. It cuts cleanly, that's easy on the rose. You're using mechanical advantage, 
to make your work easier with things like lopping shears. If you take out the oldest growth periodically, you can get a rose that's quite old. I have quite a few in the garden that are as old as uh, when I planted them 30 odd years ago. And the oldest rose known is one that's somewhere between 700 and 1,000 years old in Hildesheim, Germany, was bombed out during the war and it's back. It's back up to a uh, uh, size that you see there in the photo. Now there is a lot of controversy about, do you have to do this perfectly on pruning? The answer is no, they'll survive. There was a test done in England where they pruned three different beds of identical roses in three different ways, pruning straight across, even I think it was with head shears, then pruning straight across, mowing them down in effect with a uh, sharp blade. And then the way I'm gonna teach, which is prune them to an outside pointing bud. And the reason you do that is so that it's not all clogged up in the middle with a lot of growth. Uh, you do it with the sharp shears and you point the bud away from the area you want it. Uh, uh, well, you point it in the area you want it to grow. So point them outside, away from the center. That keeps the center from getting clogged up with a lot of leaves and a lot of growth. And that reduces all sorts of uh, insects and diseases that get into the middle and cause problems. If you prune too high, and you can see this, in a uh, illustration here and a real life illustration here, this was pr pruned above a growth point and it died back. Uh, there's nothing for the energy of the growth to go to up here. And so it went there and this died back. So this is a little too high. This is a little too low and the bud dries out. And the best is sort of like this doesn't have to be exactly 45 degrees, doesn't have to be a quarter inch, but it does uh, help if you prune it above the bud eye in a way like this. Pruning large and uh, mini roses. This is what most people have in their yard. Uh, think of it as the hybrid tea that you buy at uh, Home Depot or at a uh, nursery. And if you remove the dead disease crossing very weak growth, that's the most important thing. Clear out the center and leave an open base shape. Literally, uh, I can take my hand and hold it up with the five fingers, and that's a good way to remember it. Leave the strongest five, uh, three to five canes, meaning the branches, if you will. That's typical for modern roses. Remove the oldest canes periodically. Today, I took a uh, big shrub I had and took out one that was about an inch in in diameter and before I've taken out big canes that are up to a couple inches in diameter that are very old. By doing that, you rejuvenate the root rose. Floribundas, flower abundant, sort of, um, that's the name. Uh, you leave more branching structure. You're looking for uh, a lot of flowers, a lot of fluorescence or uh, uh, inflorescence rather rather. And then you're doing lighter pruning. By light pruning, maybe a third reduction on the plant. Doesn't have to be exact. You can do heavy pruning if you want long stems on things like hybrid tea roses. That's heavy pruning might be up to two thirds reduction. So if I've got a seven foot tall hybrid tea and it's too big for the area, I might take it down uh, to a couple of feet tall. And uh, that's not gonna hurt the rose. You'll get fewer blooms, but stronger stems in that kind of pruning. You can use a prop. And I literally took the photo down at the bottom here this morning when I put a prop in a rose that I, uh, pr I pruned. Not everybody teaches this, but it can help if you have a, a structure that's a little too tight. If canes are too close in the middle and crowded, find a convenient thorn. And if you look very carefully down here at the fuzzy uh, picture, you might see the cut end of a, a piece of material here that's a Y and it's stuck on a thorn. And then I put the other Y out here and it props it open. And by propping it open, 
uh, the next year you'll fi maybe find this same crop there when you go to prune it. And you'll find that if you take it out, the roses grow in the way that you've uh, propped it. Sort of like bonsai, if you know anything about that. The plants grow as they're trained. You can use waste material. I was using something that I had just pruned out that had a Y in it. You can cut the bottom flat and then you can stick it on a thorn. For uh, rose standards, which everybody calls tree roses, there are actually four different pieces of growing material. The roots are grafted onto a, a type of rose that will form a nice strong trunk. And so you've got roots, you've got trunk. And if you've ever seen, and I saw some of these even at a Home Depot where there's two different roses, there are two different grafts on the top. You may not notice it, but they're slightly offset. And so there are four pieces of growing material. Uh, for simplicity, I call these antlers, so they sort of remind me of antlers. And you prune the, these, these antlers like you would a bush. Open an airy, cut out weak, crossing dead or broken canes. If anything comes up from here, the bottom, that's a sucker because this is a different material. Uh, and I often find these are, if they do bloom, they bloom once and they're red. That's probably something called Dr. Huey rootstock. Here's an example after it's been pruned and I'm gonna show a very quick video. I hope this comes across. It might be a little uh, jerky, but you should be able to hear what I'm saying and then see the, uh, what I do to clean up after it's been pruned. I put the sheet in the background so you can see what's going on. But you can see it's been pruned down and I'll show you a picture afterwards of what happens afterwards. You, you get a regrowth that's about uh, double or triple the size of this area. Okay, uh, now I'm going to clean up the uh, uh, bud union here a little bit. You can see there's old bark, there are a few stubs prior, prior pruning that I should have taken off last year, but I didn't. Clean it up. You can actually use a wire brush on these, and you might get some additional what are called basal breaks, meaning from the bud union or the base here, you get new growth out of this area. Uh, allowing it to get more sunlight on it helps. Uh, having things like growth promoters like alfalfa, which has a natural uh, growth stimulant called tricontinol. And that is something that can actually help on basic breaks. But you can see it's now maybe a little up, uh, lopsided, but about 12 inches, maybe a little up to 18 inches uh, off to the side. Some of the old growth are removed and it's more or less symmetrical. Uh, that's what you want when you're done with a, a uh, rose that is going to be a standard tree rose. Thank you. And this I actually took just a couple of weeks ago before I pruned it again. This uh, one has been pruned. And the area that you saw before is sort of in the big yellow area. And this just shows a few of the things that were left uh, probably on the three or four cycles of bloom after deadheading, et cetera. So you can see it's much larger uh, from the, the, uh, where the bud union is at the top to the top where there are some blooms. This was an Olympiad rose. After each bloom cycle, you deadhead and cut back a little bit. And alfalfa was added to this and that helps on the growth. Alfalfa pellets, I'll talk about those later. How do you prune climbers? This is a little different, and I'll show a, a short video on that as well. To prune those, you remove the dead, disease, damaged, crossing, or very weak growth. Now, that sounds familiar because you basically want to do that on everything. Uh, and you train them for the first year or two and don't prune the growth. In other words, uh, first you work on the structure. After a couple of years, you're going to do what I'm talking about here, which is uh, you take and train the materials out to the side, and then you can either flush cut it, which is frankly very easy. You just cut everything off the uh, long horizontal canes, or you cut it to a few bud eyes, meaning leaf sets if you still have leaves on it, and uh, you, that grows up. The thing about uh, when you 
take and point the tips down, it uh, creates something that's called apial uh, upward growth. And this means that they'll go up. Now, if you wanted to cover a, a larger structure, so you have one course of uh, branches going out and down to the side, you let these things grow and then you tip those down and you tip those down and you've got a couple of layers of uh, growth up to the top. I'm gonna show this very briefly in my yard where I have two different uh, climbers. This is a uh, set of two climbing roses. This, these happen to be New Dawn. They're fairly old. They've been in these large pots in these locations for over 15 years. They go up and over uh, an arch. And the idea is the ones that are on this side, you want it to go up, over, and down. And you just prune away a lot of the material that uh, is extra, but keep the nice limber canes going up, over, and down. You want the ends to go down. And that keeps growth coming up all along. And it'll bloom all along this whole area. Next, I'll talk about removing suckers. And uh, every good rose garden I've been in, I, I won't even include mine in the good rose gardens, but uh, there are always suckers if they're grafted materials. The one here with these uh, red and a little bit of pink roses are from the San Jose Rose Garden. And I've uh, given tours up at Filoli and the Filoli Rose Garden has suckers too on anything that's been grafted. I mean, and most roses that you buy at many rose uh, nurseries, et cetera, are grafted. If not, they'll say own root. They're on their own roots. Uh, so this one's from the San Jose Rose Garden. The pink was the desired rose. All this red over here, they're suckers. And they're probably Dr. Huey. Uh, they bloom once in the spring and that's it. Uh, the suckers in my own garden here, there's a sucker, there's another sucker. And this is on a rose standard, one of those, whoops, sorry, upright roses that I mentioned. Uh, the, here's one where the sucker is apparent. Here's where I've taken it out. Get it all the way down as closely as you can to the root. The best thing to do is work it back and forth till it breaks off so there's no material that's uh, still out there. But if you have to try to cut it off as close to the root as you can. They do come back on many roses. Some are more prone to suckering than others. What you do to uh, give it some food at this time of year or slightly later, and I'll talk about that. Right now you buy the plants that fit the space, small plants in front, large plants in back. If you've got a fence and you're putting something against it, that's a great place for a climber or large rows. You space between the plants about the same as the plant width. In other words, if it's a three foot uh, wide plant, you really should have three foot on each side uh, it, before you get to the next plant at least. Uh, and space between them is the plant width. Uh, so if a uh, rose is three feet wide on each one, you wanna go six feet over for the next plant at least. You want to test your soil conditions. You can use very simple tests for this. Some in nurseries that uh, just really test a few minor things or 15 bucks, a little, few more uh, you, uh, tests you can do for about 60. You can send it away, but really what you need to do is some simple tests and some understanding of uh, the uh, composition of the soil and the pH. You can uh, do some simple tests by uh, even squeezing the soil and seeing if you can form something that's like a cigar. And if it uh, stays in that shape, it's probably clay. If it uh, uh, breaks off in chunks, it's probably a, a sort of a loam or a silty. And if it uh, just crumbles, it's probably sandy. But that's a very, very rough estimation of what it is. There are some other tests. Uh, but pH uh, six to seven, slightly acidic is best. Uh, you amend the soil well, at, and uh, I like 
one third well rotted compost for most soils. I, I, the organic materials that I use uh, break down slowly. They don't tend to burn. And a few examples here, these are uh, examples taken of the, uh, the Lingso shelves where they have a, a bunch of different types of things. You can see some that are pretty high in nitrogen. This is nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and potassium. Uh, the the uh, cottonseed meal is pretty high in nitrogen. And then there are some that are very high in nitrogen like blood meal and uh, some that are balanced and some that are very high in uh, uh, phosphorus, for instance, bone meal. Those are really good for uh, roots. If you think of something for uh, fertilizers, uh, the, the mnemonic is up, down, and all around. Up meaning growth, down meaning roots, and all around for uh, all around uh, requirements for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the plant. Uh, I like to use slow release, and there are some good ones. Uh, there are things like, uh, there's several kinds of brands, Osmocote's one where it has an osmotic release slowly for the fertilizer. And there are some synthetics uh, in, in this mix that I've got on the table here, for instance. This one has some urea in it, uh, but uh, this breaks down really easily. Then there's some that are mixes of organics. This has seaweed, uh, and uh, this one has quite a few things, including alfalfa, feather meal, bone meal, blood meal, all sorts of different things in, in these mixes. Very cheap and very available uh, through feed stores is alfalfa, alfalfa pellets. Get the kind without molasses. These alfalfa pellets uh, have nice nutrients and they have tricontinol, like I mentioned in one of the videos. Tricontinol is a growth stimulant. And I have some pretty good sized uh, roses, very healthy. And the other thing I like is compost. And I add a, a ring of compost at the drip zone in the early spring, and that helps give nutrition and uh, some other things. Uh, plant or replace, uh, the poor performers, shovel prune them as you need to. Uh, and I mentioned pH and testing. In February or thereabouts when it starts to uh, grow actively, finger prune. And you do that by pushing down in the middle of the plant uh, uh, on anything that's growing toward the middle. And these, uh, these new growths break off very easily. Leave other growths where you want it. Uh, keep the growth from the bud union down the way at the bottom because that's the future of the rose. Prune them once bloomers, after bloom, and just shape them and remove the dead and diseased growth. Examples of the fungal diseases that appear a little later, rust, black spot. Rust right now looks darker than this uh, illustration. This is summertime rust. Then these, blacks, these uh, spots turn black. How do you deal with those? And how do you keep it from having so much during the year? Uh, one thing you can do, if you don't spray for diseases, you can get more air and light in the middle, middle and, that, uh, and reduce the uh, ground to foliage height, six to eight inches, maybe up to a foot, and clean up the debris. That reduces the amount of spores that uh, propagate the material. The uh, dormant spray, which is illustrated here, copper-based dormant sprays with oil. There are a couple of different types of oils here. Uh, it reduces pests and diseases over the year. Insects are smothered by the oils and neem oil, which is derived from the neem tree, uh, native to India, has other actions. It's a miticide and a mild insecticide as well. Black spot is often worst in wet weather. If you remove the infected leaves, that's good. If you spray, use less toxic sprays. They're all registered as uh, organic by the USDA. And the OMRI, the Organic Materials Research Institute, uh, can only list uh, USDA or organic sprays. Those can be used on organic fruits and vegetables in case you didn't know that. Uh, but that's a whole nother story. If you spray, read and follow the label. 
protect yourself. Wash, wash up afterwards. Spray early on a day that is dry, like today. Not windy, like today. And will be dry for 24 hours. And later on, do it before the bees appear because uh, they don't like oil either. Oils and soaps in a day not exceeding 80 degrees, not hard right now, but later in the spring, uh, you want to not do it on that kind of a day because it'll burn the tips of the leaves. You want to spray the underside of the leaves as well as the tops. Spray the ground around the plant lightly. You're not trying to saturate it, but you're trying to get rid of some of these spores. If there's a leaf on the ground, think of this, that leaf that had rust on it. Think of it on the ground. Think of spraying the top of it. That didn't do a thing for those rust spores. Clean up and then spray the canes till they're wet and the ground around the plant. Then as we get into uh, spring, say March, whenever the rains stop, uh, set the timers to water deeply and infrequently. By doing that this year, I cut out about 30% of my water use. Uh, and later when the rain started, basically about 90% of the water use. Uh, five gallons per week for a large plant, usually enough in the summer. By after you've cleaned up and, and your beds are all nice and clean, you've applied mulch uh, and uh, any fertilizer that's been dug in, then you can, add, uh, I'm sorry, added uh, compost and any uh, fertilizer that's been dug in. Then you can apply mulch. If you apply it two to five inches deep, which is quite a bit of mulch, around the bed with a clear space right around the base of the plant, that really reduces water use and weeds. Makes weeds easier to pull if you do get them. You can add balance and fertilizers and compost under the mulch and work it into the soil. So that's the quick discussion. I'm gonna leave time for questions and answers. I'll read some out of the chat uh, as we've gone along. I hope you've, got some, you've gotten some things out of this. I'd be happy to answer questions. This, uh, I wanna thank the San Mateo Arboretum Society for hosting and uh, the uh, UC Cooperative Extension Master Gardeners for supporting with material for this presentation. Uh, I prepared it myself uh, and this gives a little background on me. I've, uh, uh, the president a long time ago and recently with the Peninsula Rose Society and vice president this year. All the illustrations and photos are mine. Uh, for master gardeners, for those of you that aren't aware of it, I know the master gardeners come to the Arboretum Society uh, later in the year for uh, meeting for outside sessions. But once we get our go ahead to have our offices open, there are different days where we're out in different places the Veterans Memorial Senior Center in Redwood City, in San Francisco, the Botanical Garden, and out at Elkus Ranch out near Half Moon Bay. Uh, fairly remote, but it's an interesting center uh, where we have demonstration gardens and things like that. But you can always uh, go on the email with questions that'll be answered by Master Gardeners. or information on roses that uh, you might be interested in, the PeninsulaRoseSociety.org is going to have uh, some information posted, including some general slides, but also a reprint of a article I just wrote for the Peninsula Rosarian and was published a little earlier this year, well, very early this year. And uh, we now have Zoom meetings for our main meeting, but we also have some extra Zoom meetings on Thursdays, uh, and that's been very uh, well received. We have a uh, email to put in questions, consulting rosarians at peninsularosociety.org. We have YouTube videos. You saw excerpts from a couple of these, and you can search for those at Peninsula Rose Society YouTube and you'll find our channel and some of the things that are on there. You can email me if you wish, the very secret e email address of stewdalton at gmail.com or look on www.peninsularosesociety.org under resources. Here are some links that you really can't link, uh, click on now, but those are listed on that if you search for Peninsula Rose Society YouTube.
These are uh, pruning shrub roses, hedge trimmers, tools, proper cuts, pruning tree sta uh, uh, standard roses, and on repotting roses, if you're interested in that. Uh, there's some references here. Basically, with many questions, you can go on to UC and then put in the issue or question and plant. You can get a lot of information that way. The Peninsula Rose Society, uh, pardon me, the American Rose Society has a consulting rosarian handbook you can actually download. It's in, in the public uh, domain these days. And the American Rose Society also has guides for uh, rose diseases and their management. So uh, that is the end of the general presentation. I've left about uh, 20 minutes here uh, for questions, answers. We can go first to the chat, I believe, and then uh, see what's going on at that point. And I'm gonna stop sharing and go back to the image. So uh, uh, if we could have, I, I, I think Susan, you were going yep. to, you were going to read the questions? Yes, we have a question from Maggie. Have you heard of or tried using a spray of one third milk and two thirds water to control rust and black spot on roses? There are a number of things that work. If you look at the UC uh, site, what they say to, uh, as a uh, eradicant for, uh, the, the, well, let me re restate that. I've, I've heard of a lot of things. And uh, black spot uh, is a fungal disease, so is rust. And uh, I prefer to use uh, things that are listed for organic use. And actually there's one that's a nutritional supplement you can buy on Amazon as a supplement, potassium bicarbonate. And there's also one that the University of North Carolina researched years ago that uses baking soda, sodium bicarbonate. Potassium bicarbonate is listed by UC as something that actually is an eradicant for mildew. The trouble is uh, it's not in a form that's uh, easily spread. Uh, so uh, what you can do on that is uh, you can mix it and there's some possibilities for that, but mix it with a little bit of surfactant. Soap is an example of a surfactant. Detergent is an example of surfactant. Some people use a few drops of Dove in with the sodium bicarbonate to spread it on the leaves. Uh, there are a lot of things that are talked about. Some things make it look better like baking soda, but uh, it, the, the thing about some of the organics like neem oil, they have actions that are stronger as a, uh, as a uh, fungicide. And the, the best, especially for dormant spraying, is copper. And that's used in uh, spraying roses, berries, all sorts of things. It's used for food crops. Uh, and the problem with copper is it can burn. And so dormant, that's not an issue. It's not an issue for bees and pollinators because you're not spraying it when they're bees or pollinators, you're spraying it when the canes are bare and dormant and there's no bees around. Uh, so that's, uh, there are all sorts of ideas out there for mixes and uh, milk and water isn't gonna do much to kill the spores. Okay, Inter interesting. Um, and we had a rose in the rose garden last year, fairly early on the new growth that just got covered in rust. And I removed almost all the leaves from it, disposed of them. The rose was beautiful the rest of the year. No more problem. So no, just uh, can't, uh, well, just can't picking the leaves. Yeah. And for black spot, that's one of the recommended ways to uh, help deal with it because it usually goes away as the weather dries, dries out. Black spot needs splashed water uh, to activate the spores. Rust is more of a problem all year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best way to uh, prevent it is air and light and doing a dormant spray and getting rid of as many of the spores as you can. One other thing is reducing the uh, uh, the splashback possibilities from the bottom. And by doing the stripping off leaves from the bottom, say six, eight inches, 
it reduces the amount of splash pack of spores and it also helps the air and light go into the middle of the air, especially. And that reduces fungal diseases. Yeah, this, this last year we had some aphids early in the year and we just, but we were very selective and very careful. We just used a light slope, soap solution, probably Dawn, but still very careful because it was, uh, we didn't wanna kill any of the good, good bugs. Well, and there's an even uh, easier way because one thing I've learned is aphids are dumb. They don't come back if you spray them off. And I use a two gallon per minute fogget nozzle on an angled uh, uh, spray head. So it, it, you can reach down and underneath the leaves and it puts this very strong spray uh, of, uh, of water and use water. Uh, guessing maybe 90, 95% of the aphids can't find their way back, they're dumb. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you do more than one spray on a couple day uh, thing, I never have problems with aphids. They don't kill the plants anyway. And yeah. so I just knock them off and they, they go searching for the leaf and they can't find it. It, it works. Also is good for mites, uh, most mites, not, not chili strips and uh, things like that. But for most mites using that water spray, usually they're down at the bottom in the hotter weather. And the water spray is a, is a good way to do it obviously organic. Um, and I don't even use soap on those. I just use water. Interesting. Hey, okay, next question. Uh, how to prune very small hedge roses that are one to two feet high? Uh, one thing I use a lot, uh, the ones in back of me, for instance, on this photo are Sally Holmes. I know the, uh, the Arboretum has a nice Sally Holmes too. And I use a hedge trimmer. Mm -hmm. And that's almost all I use on the uh, on hedges uh, or on these big climbing roses. It, it, it's amazing how much you can take off. I have 15 of these Sally Holmes. It's amazing how much you can take off in a couple of minutes. I used them for the last few days on my roses out in front to get the shape down. And for hedges in general, like say a simplicity hedge or something like that, that's uh, designed to be a hedge row, Hedgerows, frankly, the first thing I do is hedge trim it. If there's anything dead, damaged or diseased, I take that out. I don't do much else. I don't carefully prune every one of the little tiny roses with the hedge trimmers. And as I say, they did some tests over in England. Um, I, I'm not sure of the, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the, uh, uh, the uh, facility that they did that in, but it, uh, it works. And I've had really good success. The ones in back of me, you see those? Gorgeous. Those are all pruned with hedge trimmers. Yeah, yeah. Next question. Are most roses edible? Would roses be good to add to an edible slash vegetable garden? Uh, roses are edible. Uh, in uh, the Middle Ages, roses were used as money. Uh, they... Uh, have been used for jams, for Turkish delight, for uh, rose hip tea. Uh, some of the ones like Rosa Ragosa and things like that have huge rose hips. And so uh, you can, there's a lot of vitamin C in those. Uh, there's, uh, there's the, the petals are edible. I, I don't like the taste of them too much, but uh, it, it, they are edible. In jellies and jams and things, I've had rose hip jam, I've had candies, I've had uh, from uh, rose. And then of course, there are the fragrances. Uh, they're used uh, mostly from the damask rose and those are uh, non-toxic. A uh, question from Stephen. It says, uh, my hybrid rose brandy has been producing very long and strong sp uh, spiking branches after prior pruning, why? Could it be because too much fertilizer? Could be. And uh, one thing to watch when you do fertilize is not over fertilize with nitrogen early in the year. If you wanna reduce the amount of aphids, they like the new succulent growth. And uh, you might wanna try a little less nitrogen on the first uh, round of that, but uh, it could be if they look unusual, there's something called a witch's broom that can happen. It's rare, 
but it, it looks like a lot of different, very, very spiky uh, growth. And, uh, that, or a candelabra is another term for that. It's, it's very branched. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say long, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's long and individual blooms or long and just normal looking blooms or if it's something unusual looking. But in any case, okay. other, other questions or do we want to open it up? Okay, uh, yeah. next question is from Judith. This is, how can you judge five gallons per week on a watering system? Uh, they, the, it depends on the kind of watering system. Uh, I've got something like 600 drippers. I've got a area of uh, a bed of nothing but roses and that's overhead watered. Uh, I have a very small area that, well, I don't have any roses on uh, hose, uh, dripper hose that is, pardon me, weeping hose. Uh, but most of mine are on drip systems that are adjustable and they can go from zero to 10 gallons per minute, pardon me, per hour. And so 30 minutes on that one dripper, if I uh, ever did it that way, would be five gallons on uh, when it's fully open. And I adjust them to, so that I've got several drippers usually around a very big rose uh, or it's overhead watered. If you wanna know how much water in inches per hour, uh, the old uh, way to do it is the tuna fish can open empty and you put it out, put them out in a couple of areas and you see how much they fill up and measure it over a, say a 10 minute period. And that gives you an idea of how many inches of water you get in that area. The other way to uh, figure it is if you hose water, you can do a, a basin around it at approximately the drip line, meaning the outside of the rows, and you can build it up a couple of inches. You fill up the basin once, fill up the basin twice, let it seep, and that'll be enough for a rose for a week. There was tests done at UC Davis on how much water a rose really needs to survive, as opposed to nice luxuriant blooms like over my shoulder. And it's amazing. They did in Davis, which is a hotter, uh, just a couple of waterings all summer long and really no watering. And there are some roses, old roses especially, some others that do pretty well. Uh, some of the hybrid teas need a little more water, but uh, the, uh, the five gallons per week should be more than enough. And you wanna deeply water infrequently rather than a little bit of water every day. And what that does is it makes the roots go deep. Uh, so deep water infrequently. Uh, Denise asks, any way to discourage deer? They seem to choose certain roses. No, that's the short answer. The long answer, uh, you can look on UC uh, deer, uh, and it's a pest note. Uh, deer are cute little animals, but they love roses. The story I can say is we had a, probably 30 years ago, we had a tour of a beautiful uh, estate in Woodside that had a thousand roses along a long driveway, and then some in a enclosure. The enclosure was high enough so the deer couldn't get it. The night before we were going to tour, not a single rose bloom was left. <laughs> if they're hungry enough, they'll eat anything. And they, they, we said, roses are edible. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're really good at eating uh, roses. Um, there are things that are uh, suggested. Uh, the best is a, a set of fences. But if you um, look on UC rose, I, I'm sorry, well, I mean, look at UC deer prevention or deer uh, problem, you'll find it on, the, on their site. And it really just says, if they're hungry enough, they'll eat anything. Mm -hmm. Very good. I don't see any more questions. So if anybody has any questions, please send it in now. And anyway, it was really excellent presentation, Stu. And, uh, and if you want, you can uh, have people raise their hand. There's a way to raise their hand on the, uh, okay. the, the reactions. Okay. And then you can uh, have them unmute themselves. <laughs> okay. I don't mind answering any uh, 
yeah in person either okay well that was really excellent and i haven't done any pruning in my garden yet so maybe this week we well get you know we've got the uh hiatus right now i think i pruned yeah. six roses this morning and then uh did some uh cuttings for another dozen uh and uh, uh I, i've been doing a couple hundred uh or at least a hundred rows cuttings every year for the last couple of years and wow. uh for uh, uh our uh peninsula rose society uh we, we give them away well everybody in the rose society is a wonderful organization and they really want to learn more about roses they really should should look into joining yeah, and some wonderful meetings and videos. So, and thank you for joining, since I know you did this a couple of years ago here. Yeah, yeah. So, a uh, couple of comments here. Uh, Liz, a uh, really wonderful presentation. Thank you. And Steve says thank you, Stu and Susan. Great day to prune today. So, yes, agreed. Uh, wear heavy shirts, uh, glasses, hats. I, I have had it where a, a stray uh, climber decided to let loose on me and went like that. And the thorn got me right there. It made me really conscious about using a brimmed hat so that the thing would hit here. Mm -hmm. And goggles or glasses or sunglasses, whatever you prefer. So uh, protect yourself. Thorns can cause nasty injury yes some serious infections too i've had to have it lanced yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay i don't see anything else coming through so i want to thank you Stu, for another excellent program so much great information and i know i always learn something new so to everyone in a few days you will be emailed a link to recording of the presentation any unanswered questions can be addressed at that time you will also receive an evaluation form we would appreciate feedback on what worked and where we can improve. So on Saturday, January 15th, uh, come and help prune Central Park's Rose Garden. Uh, come to learn share, or share your expertise. This is a free event in which you will contribute to the beautification of Sam Mateo's beloved Rose Garden. No experience is necessary. Volunteers from the San Mateo Arboretum Society will be on hand to instruct beginners. Dress warmly, bring pruning shears, gloves, hats, and uh, masks, please. And uh, registration is preferred, but not required. So you can register at sanmateoarboretum.org slash classes dash events. We will have some light refreshments and beverages. Uh, our next free Zoom seminar will be the Beauty of Camellias on Sunday, February 13th from 1 to 2.30 p.m with Jean Fleet and Meg Milani from the San Francisco Peninsula Camellia Society. Register on our website, sanmateoarboretum.org slash classes dash events. Also, let us know if you're interested in volunteering by emailing us at info at sanmateoarboretum.org or call 650-579-0536. Uh, we have a variety of opportunities from working in the nursery, greenhouse community outreach maintenance and organizing our monthly seminars and workshops so thank you for joining us today everyone and the program is now finished <laughs>